Anyway, this bloke got into a storm drain. There was this young policewoman guarding it. She had a weapon drawn, but the guy came charging out. Knocked off a weapon. That's the last anyone saw of him. Bill Mason, I've got a room booked. I've nearly given up on you. I had some car trouble. Set me back a couple of hours. I'll take you out. PJ, are you saying that if a guy had been guarding the storm drain, he wouldn't have got away? Well, we don't know, do we, Mags? The point is, she wasn't prepared to pull the trigger. Is there any need to? <sighs> Breakfast is at 7.30. Jane Hanson there. After the break, the continuing mystery of a 19-year-old boy who disappeared without trace four years ago while travelling between Sydney and Melbourne. I'm sorry, I should have realised. Don't blame you. Four years is a long time. We stayed here over a month, I should have remembered. If it's any consolation, I scarcely remember you. It wasn't the best time in my life. Look, don't stay up here on your own. Come downstairs and have a drink. Yeah, as well. Four years ago, Paul Mason was 19. A TAFE student, his exams were finished and he was on his way back to Melbourne. Like most people, he was heading home for Christmas. Only Paul never made it. His father had sent him a train ticket, but unfortunately he chose to cash it in and hitchhike. Silly bugger. We know he stopped off at the small township of Mount Thomas. Town. He was last seen buying cigarettes at a roadside diner there and he said to the proprietor that he expected to be staying in Mount Thomas for a day or so before heading on to Melbourne. But nothing is known of his movements after he left the diner. Cafe, pal. It's possible that Paul is still alive somewhere and has chosen, for reasons of his own, to disappear. But his family believe otherwise. He'd rung home from a call box the day before and had asked his father to pass on some messages to his friends, ordinary messages, about a party they were going to together, about returning his guitar. His father believes that Paul may have met with foul play. Four years ago, Paul was a good-looking young man of slight build and average height, dark eyes and dark hair. He was wearing a red jacket with a distinctive logo on the back, a surfer on the crest of a wave surfing into a shark's mouth. Someone out there may have seen Paul Mason or may remember the jacket. Someone may have given him a lift out of Mount Thomas and may remember him now. If you have any information at all that could help the police, Please phone your local police station. The weather Why? throughout the what state is expected. State of origin's on in a minute. Can I get you another? <laughs> no, thanks, Chris. I might go up now. Uh, could I take a couple of bottles up? So what's he doing here, seeing if anything turns up? I guess so. Chris, there's nothing to say to keep on the trouble here. Yeah, but weren't there a couple of sightings on the road from Sydney? People who gave him the lift, and then nothing from here on. It still doesn't mean anything. Look, I'm sorry for the old man. He wouldn't be. But talking four years, and without a body, it's a waste of time. You want a body? Every day that passes on a murder investigation, Roz, the trail gets colder. If you haven't signed it up within 48 hours, your chances are getting slim. Am I right, boys? Yeah, he's right. right. After about a week, the trial does go. You get people calling in tomorrow. I'm 84 years of age, and I think I once saw a kid like they said on the television show. You ask them where and when, Roz, and they don't, they don't have the faintest. Now, you see the problem. Blonde hair, no, that's not right. Well, yes, I guess he could have changed his hair colour, couldn't he? Now, can you tell me what sort of build he had? Build! Was he of slight build? No, no, I'm not having a go at you. I'm taking you seriously. We appreciate any sort of public assistance. However, Donny. Mount Thomas Police. Yes, that's right. No, not last year, four years ago. No, no, no. It was a red jacket. Sorry, what was that? Ah, oh, colourblind. Good morning. Good morning. I'm. Uh... Sorry about last night. Why? What did you do last night? Well, the people in the bar and the television, they don't really mean to be offhand. You're talking about the cops that were here? Yeah. Can you join me? Sure. I don't mind about the cops. Kids disappearing. It's everyday life to them. I don't expect the world to stop because I'm grieving for Paul. You do believe that something happened to him, don't you? I mean, you're convinced that he couldn't have just decided not to come home, not to contact you? Yeah, I'm convinced. It was Christmas, you see. It at least have wronged for Christmas. 
You know, he could have changed his mind about hanging around for a few days. I mean, he's walking down the street. A guy offers him a lift. If something happened, it could have happened anywhere between here and Melbourne, boss. There's the father. You'd do him a big favour if you told him to forget all about this, go home, get on with his life. Yes, madam. Mr Mason, come on through. Of that description? Uh-huh. Was it Christmas four years ago? Yes, that's right. What someone saw him? What was he doing outside the cafe? Why did he stick in that mine? Mr Mason. What was he doing? Where was he I'll going? See. How did he look? Look, I'm sorry. I, I can't hear Mr. you. Mr Mason, you've got to let the constable do her job. Thank you. Yes, back again. Now, average height, that's about five foot nine. Yeah. All right, well, can you tell me about the other fellow? Thanks for About six you. foot. Bye-bye. Well, well, listen, thank you very much for your call, OK? Yeah, bye-bye. Can I help you, mate? Yeah, that, that kid that went missing, was a reward ever offered? Oh, I couldn't tell you. It was before my time. Hold on a sec, I'll just check for you. PJ, yeah. a lady's Where agreed to meet me over at the cafe. I think uh, she may have seen Paul Mason. Hey, fellas, uh, is there a reward on offer for information on Paul Mason? Uh, not a public one. His dad put up 10000 privately. I assume it's still on offer. Good out. Hey, did you just see a young fella here? No, sorry, man. Where were you when you think you saw him? Well, I don't know. I'd parked, I suppose. Uh, I usually drive here. I come here to get cigarettes at night and I only buy one packet at a time because I'm trying to cut down. Now, are you sure it was at night? Oh, I never come at any other time. Daytime, I go to one of the nearer shops. Joe, the guy that owned this place, he said he last saw Paul during the day. Well, he might have been staying around here. Come here a few times. What else do you remember? Well, it was right on Christmas. Uh, it must have been just before I went to uh, Singapore to visit my mm -hmm. sister. Uh, I was away a month, so I didn't hear about anyone going missing around here. You think you saw him leave the cafe? What then? I think he might have got into a car. Do you have any idea of the make or the colour of the car? No. It's the jacket, that's all. I wouldn't have remembered a thing if I hadn't seen the jacket on television. So how's your wife coping now? She died last year. Oh, I'm sorry. She always seemed to be coping better than me. I hit the bottle quite a bit. Got done for drink driving. Put my license away for 12 months. Just as bloody well, too. But Patricia didn't do any of that. She seemed to be getting on briskly with her life. Wouldn't say anything much about Paul. And finally, she admitted to the doctor about this pain that she had. They diagnosed cancer with secondaries. And it was only six weeks after that that she died. Have you got any other family here? No. Came out from Birmingham 29 years ago. Met Patricia here. The rest of the family's back there. Have you ever thought of going back? Paul's here. Or his body is. Thanks, sir. After this, I'll get out of your way. What, go home? To the pub. I would ring you at home. People saw him all along the way until here. And then nothing. If it happened, it happened here. Or near here. I only caught that bloody train. The woman buying the cigarettes. You get anything more out of her? No. No. Well, I think we might as well forget about the rest of this lot. And not follow it up. Well, what do you think, Max? Tell I me. I think you should keep your voice down. Listen, uh, thanks for all this. However it turns out. No worries, sir. Hope we find something. As long as you don't have to go out of your way to do it. Come on, Maggie. I just said there was nothing here. That's all. Hey, Maggie. That's all he said. You've got to admit it, mate. There's not much. PJ. Yeah? Why is everybody being so negative? Well, give us something positive then, Mags. Like colour, make and rego number. Now, this sort of stuff, it just ties up real police work. Yeah, well, PJ, as far as I'm concerned, this is real police yeah, work. Yeah, and what if we get an emergency? If we get an emergency, then we'll handle it. what if you're on your own? What do you mean, in the station? Oh, out on the road, on your own. Then, PJ, I'll handle it, okay? Put on your mags. 
So a new house, new car, how's it all going? The car's great, and I love the house. Which reminds me, we've got to come over for dinner and try a bit of my cooking for a change. You're on. Just name the night and I'll get someone to fill in. OK, Chris. Good night. Good night, Maggie. Mr Mason. Can you give me any idea how things went today with the calls? That's really up to Sergeant Croydon, not me. Look off the record, I'd appreciate it. There's not much, I'm sorry. Somebody must have seen something. Somebody must know. Mr Mason, we're not giving up. Truly, we're not. Thank you, Constable. Teal's closed, public and sharp. <laughs> Any leads yet? Oh, nothing they're prepared to talk about. I knew a girl once. I went to school with her. She was hitchhiking somewhere in Germany. Had a fight with her girlfriend. So Gillian went off on her own and caught a ride on the motorway. And a dark-coloured two-door car was the last anyone saw of her. You feel spoiled, don't you? Sitting in the bar, in an empty pub. I like it. Perhaps I shouldn't have said that. I wish people weren't so careful with me. It's an alienating thing. They don't know what to say, so they draw away just a little. Do I do that? Of course. And it's human nature. I'm just a paying guest. And if you got too close to the lives of all your paying guests, you'd hit the bottle yourself within a month. And you'd have drunk yourself out of business within a year. <laughs> <laughs> Something in that. Anyway, I can't handle pity. What about sympathy? <laughs> just out of town, there's a fork where the dirt road comes in like that. You know where I mean? Yeah. Well, this woman's coming along so fast, she couldn't stop. She skids in the gravel. Busts one of my headlights. Did a lot more damage to her car, though. Or well, she hops out, claiming I'm in the wrong, and I'm going to pay for her car. What happened then? Well, there were these three young fellas in the car. One of them, like the kid on the TV. He had a red jacket with a shark, like he said. You sure about that? Oh, yeah, yeah. But I wouldn't have remembered if I hadn't seen the kid acting him on the TV. Now, the other two blokes, they were older than the kid with the jacket. They were greasy-looking, skinny, bikey types. Well, they were carrying on like they were drunk or stoned, wanting me to fork over for the woman's car on the spot. <laughs> kind of threatening. Well, the kid, he's telling them to calm down, ease up, as if he knew she was in the wrong. Go on. Well, I said I'd get on the radio, call you blokes, let you sort it out. She said something to the other three. I got back in the car and drove off. Did you do anything more about it? Oh, yeah, I came in here and reported it. Right. Wasn't going to have her popping up later making claims. So you reported the register number of the other vehicle, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Why didn't you report citing the kid before now? I mean, there was a lot of publicity about him at the time. I didn't see anything of it. I've been working up north of Brisbane for six months. I just happened to see the thing in the motel on the TV, night before last. Uh, this vehicle went to the junkyard last year. It was crushed for scrap. Before that, it belonged to a woman, one Kelly Jane Morrison. Here's the address. Good work. Ta. A truck ran into me in the main street last year. That must be what he's thinking of. Bent the whole chassis. His insurance company paid and they wrote it off. Oh, he's quite definite. Just before Christmas, four years ago. No. It's in the computer. Who reported it? He did. No one came here to see me. No police, I mean. Well, it was self-reported. Matter for the insurance companies. We wouldn't have followed it up. I've got registration wrong. Wrong number. Well, they got the make and colour right. <laughs> it just wasn't me. What could you have lent your car to anyone? I don't think so. Do you recognise this person? No. Is he the truck driver that told you all this? No, uh, someone of his description was seen in the car with you. I don't know anyone like that. And I didn't ever have the accident you're talking about. I'd help you if I could, but I can't. I'm sorry. Well, thanks anyway. Well, she says no. No kid, no truck, no nothing. Well, that truck is a pretty reliable bike. And his report's on file. Yeah, we'll see. Where's Maggie? Out checking a couple of yesterday's calls. Ah, 
Uh, Made a point of it, did she? Yeah, sort of. Where's the boss? Oh, he's over St. David's, as far as I know. Yeah? Air 450 to Mount Thomas Station or Mount Thomas Vehicle. Repeat Air 450 to Mount Thomas or any vehicle that can copy. Mount Thomas 308 standing by. Uh, yes, 308, we are looking for a suitable location to land. The fuel line is cracked. We require local knowledge and some assistance. Over. Air 450, try the Mount Thomas Sports Oval on Thomas Road. All right, sounds good. Uh, can you make your way there and advise us? Uh, she's bucking a lot. Uh, hold her steady, please, man. Enjoy it, because it's fun. That's right. Keep it going, kids. Keep it going. Get the kids off the field and keep them back. Go. Come on, kids. Get back. I'm at the Oval now. Good, we should be in visual contact soon. Air 450, I, I don't see you anywhere. We're approaching from the south. Do you see any landmarks? Well, nothing at this stage. Perhaps if you can activate your flashing lights and we can get a fix on your location. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> Can't hear anything. We're making our approach now. Farewell, Major Beaver Smell. For Keen and Country, Death and Glory! Don't speak, Constable. <laughs> So there's Maggie in the middle of the football field waving her arms around and the coach and all the little kiddies trying to play football have been herded into the side. Yeah, we should have asked her to take off a piece of clothing and uh, wave it around. Poor Maggie. She'd have done the same to us. But you guys play really rough, you know that. Oh, we know, Chrissy, we know. Whoops. That's it. I am not going to sit here while they tell it over and over again to everybody that walks in the room. Don't show them your rattles. Right, oh, hey, 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 that's enough. Now that's enough. Now what is going on? He said if I gave him money, he could tell me something about Paul. This is the bloke who came in asking about the reward. Oh, did he? We should have a chat about that, eh? Senior? I gave him 2,000 as a deposit, the rest to follow. There's one of you born every minute, Bill. You know, I didn't weigh that up. But I've only got myself to look after now. It's been too long without word of Paul. He could have got us to pull him in and question him. And what if he'd shut up? I reckon he might have. You think you got your two grand's worth? I started talking in riddles, something to do with some guy in the slammer who might know about Paul. He was talking as though Paul was a... The way he was talking about Paul. I couldn't take it, so I hit him. I was wrong, though. I think he might know something. Well, if he does, we'll try and get it out of him. We'll also try and recover your 2,000. I'll give him a ring at the station. Just couldn't hack it, Chris. The way he was talking about Paul. You can't charge me, boss. Can't I? Why not? Self defense. He hit me first. You got a witness? The bar was full. You guys were there. Yeah, funny how nobody saw anything. It'll be his word against yours in court. I don't want to go to court. Don't you? Then let's make a start in the right direction by giving the man back his cash. Can I please see you? We could be looking at a fraud charge here, couldn't we? Unless you were planning to give the man value for money. What were you going to tell him about his son? Oh, you got quite a record here, mate. Can't look too good in court. Conning a grieving father for two grand and giving him nothing in return. It's been a long time since I hit anyone. Yeah, well, you did pretty well. What do you reckon his age was? A fair bit younger than you. I used to do a bit of boxing after I left school. My reach wasn't good, but I had a low centre of gravity. 
They couldn't knock me down. <laughs> How's your hand? Oh, it's not troubling me. I found it quite enjoyable. Yeah, well, don't go taking it up as a hobby. Certainly not in my bar. Can you stay up here for a little while? If you like. It's thinning out down below. They can do without me for a bit. A bit of company, that's all. Sure. Would you like a drink? No. Well, the story in a nutshell is that he was in the slammer over in St David's. And his cellie for most of that time was a bloke who lived near here. Been sharing a farmhouse with two other guys and a woman he was friendly with named, wait for it, Kelly Morrison. The woman who was driving that car, the truck driver says, ran into him. Mm-hmm. The very same. Interesting. Very. Anyway, this guy, the cellie, said he knew something about a kid who disappeared near Mount Thomas Christmas time a few years back. That's it. That's all he's saying. Thought we'd hold him overnight while we check it out. Good. Then I want him charged with hindering a police investigation and anything else you can think of. Yeah, I was living with Kelly for a bit. I don't know anything much else about it. Well, you become eligible for parole soon. Well, so what? Well, if you told us something worthwhile, it might make a difference to the parole board. Whatever happened, I had nothing to do with it. I'd moved on by then. Did you know Paul? Yeah. I met him in Sydney. One of those cheap overnighters near Central Station. He was just a kid on holiday. I was heading back to be with Kelly and I gave Paul the address. Told him if he ever came through that way, maybe he could look us up, we could score some dope. He had quite a bit of money on him then. Did you ever see him again? When I got back, these two guys had moved in. Kelly said they'd be paying rent, but that stopped after a week. She sort of liked them. I didn't. She said I was crowding it, so I took off for Melbourne. I rang her a few times after that. She said not to come back. Do you know if Paul actually called in? No. Kelly never said anything about him? No, nothing. Did you ask? No. I kind of forgot about him by then. So tell us about Kelly. What about her? She was nice enough. Wouldn't willingly hurt anyone. She'd spin out after a few drinks and then she'd be unpredictable. I heard she settled down. Found herself a good guy for her husband. And a little kid. But she might know something. Look, I don't wish her any but harm. She might know something, Gary. Yeah, maybe. I told you, I don't know anything about the accident with the truck. The driver must have written the number down wrong. Number plates get dusty here. It's easy enough to do. We've got more to talk about than the truck now, Kelly. We'd like you to come down to the station. What's the problem? Your wife's coming down to the station to help us with some inquiries, sir. I don't know what it's about. Well, shouldn't you tell her? We can do all that at the station, sir. Do you want me to come too? No. You stay and look after Lucy. I've advised you of your rights. Would you like a solicitor? I don't know. Did Paul Mason call on you just before Christmas four years ago, Kelly? No. But you knew him? No. You sure about that? I, I don't know him. But you know who he is. His photo was everywhere for months. There was an item about him on the television the other night. I didn't see him. But you know who he is, Kelly. Or should I say, who he was? No. But you did know a man called Gary, didn't you, Kelly? He's currently doing time in St. David's for armed robbery. You lived with him for a while in a rented farmhouse? Yes. So you know him? Yes. And did you know that he gave Paul Mason your address to look you up on the way through to Melbourne? I don't know. Well, Gary says he did. And Gary also says he moved on before Paul got there. Now, would that be right? Gary used to give lots of people my address. They never turned up. Paul never turned up. Even though he used to ride well out of his way. Perhaps he was going to see someone else. Right, now these two guys you were living with. What guys? The two guys who were there when Gary got back from Sydney. Still there after he left. How could you believe anything Gary says? He got seven for armed robbery. Uh, he's due for parole soon. That seemed to encourage him. What were their names? 
Didn't he tell you? His memory's a bit defective there. But he said one was known as Doris. Funny name. It was a nickname. And the other one? And the other one, Kelly? Zod. He called himself Zod. His real name was Peter. Was it Doris and Zod who caused Paul Mason to disappear, Kelly? No, no, it wasn't. All right, Kelly, we've got their names. It's only a matter of time until we find them. You think they're going to protect you? You've had four years to think about this. It's going to be much better for you if you tell us yourself rather than wait for us to build up a case bit by bit. Tell us what happened, Kelly. I didn't do anything to hurt him. No one said you did. Yet. But you have to tell us now. Paul was killed, wasn't he, Kelly? Yes. And his body buried near here. You know where, don't you? I'd better leave you alone. Uh, no, Chris. Do you mind? Well, if it's bad news. It's news. Of whatever sort. Isn't it? Yes. We've got a person down at the station who's prepared to say that Paul was killed not far from here and his body buried in a shallow grave. I've got no details. The story's yet to be confirmed. The person's still being interviewed. But we believe we can locate the grave. I thought you'd better know. Yes. Yes, it's better I know. Can I get you something? No. Thank you, Chris. I'd just like to sit here, sit very still, not move. Paul turned up looking for Gary, but Gary had already left by then, gone to Melbourne or somewhere. Paul had a bit of money on him. How much? Three or four hundred dollars, I think. He'd had a few days' work in Sydney and he wanted to score. And you helped out? Yeah. I got him some dope. And he hung around for a few days. We smoked it and drank a bit. We all got pretty high. There were a few arguments. I liked Paul. But the other two didn't much. But they smoked his dope. Mm. And this was about the time you collided with the truck, hmm? Yeah. Then the dope ran out. And Paul said he wanted to get more, but I couldn't get any from my source. He said that was okay, he was heading back to Melbourne anyway. It was getting close to Christmas and he wanted to be back by Christmas Day. Go on. Doris and Zod began to get the idea Paul had more money on him than he was letting on. He was going to hit a ride back that evening with the truckie if he could, but Doris persuaded him to wait until the next day. I said he might be able to fix him with a lift all the way. Mm -hmm. Zod told Paul they'd run into a guy with some high-quality dope. They'd arranged to meet out near the sports ground. Did you know what they were planning? I had no idea. I knew Doris had an old rifle, but I didn't know it was in the boot of the car. I'd never have driven them all the way out there. here if I'd had any idea. Go oh. on. We got there. It was all dark, of course. There was no one there. Zod said they'd arranged to meet a little way down a track into the bush. So he set off. It was me, Zod and Paul first up. And then I saw Doris following and he had the rifle. Go on. We stopped. And Paul said, where was the guy we were meeting? And Doris said there was no guy, and Paul had to hand over the money. Keep going, Kelly. You're near the end. And, and then Paul ran, and then Doris fired the rifle after him. 
No, I don't think he meant to hit him, just scare him, get him to stop running. But it was all dark, no one could see anything. And he hit him in the back and he staggered and fell over. Was he alive? Yes, he was on the ground and calling out. And then what did you do? We panicked and we ran back to the car. And you left him and drove away? Yes. Did you come back? Yeah, about four hours later. We took a torch. But he was dead by then. Are you sure he was dead? Yes. He was very cold and there was a huge patch of blood soaked into the ground. What happened then? Doris told me I'd have to keep my mouth shut or I'd disappear too. And then they dug a grave and buried him. You still have to show us the grave, Kelly. Why haven't they come back and told us anything? They'll be back when they've got something to tell. That's funny. When there was a shred of hope, I wanted to be certain. Either way, now it seems there's no hope left. I want it back. Never satisfied. She'll be charged. As an accessory, yes. How long have you known, Kelly? I knew her on and off since we were kids at school. We lost touch, then we met again. Got married the Christmas before last. Oh, I knew she'd had a bit of a wild patch, but something seemed to have happened to her when I met her again. Like she'd grown up overnight. She never mentioned those names to you. Paul Mason, Doris, Zod. No, never. She'd get these sudden depressions, and kind of black misery. But they'd pass. I never knew anything. God. What am I going to do now? Somewhere around here, I think. I remember the trees in the creek bed. And there's the mark on the tree. And that's the rock, I think. And that's where the grave is? No. They started digging up against the rock, but the ground was too hard. I was crying and crying and couldn't stop. They left me here and went off a little way into the dark. I heard them digging the grave and in a little while they came back. Well, could you give us a direction? I don't remember. But somewhere close by? Yes, somewhere close by. And you never came back to look for the grave, Kelly? Never? No, why would I? They left the next day and I never heard from them again. Can we go away from here now? No, not until we find him. Oh, how's the search going? Uh, well, we've sealed off the area where the body is, but no luck as yet. Well, I've had word on those two blokes. The one known as Doris died a couple of months ago of AIDS in Long Bay. Zod's been working in a nightclub up in the Cross. They expect to pick him up when he comes in for work tonight. Oh. Well, we'll have it all nicely tied up in a bow by the time homicide gets here. Just goes to show you what a little bit of exposure on the box can do, eh? Uh, it was a fluke. That tracky reporting the rego number, remembering the jacket, that was a fluke. <sighs> How about his old man? How much have you told him? Some. Better go and tell him the rest, eh? Hey? Yeah. Rather you than me. He must have been alive when they left him. If she'd only taken him to a doctor, a hospital. There are too many ifs. I suppose there always are. And the one who fired the shot, he's dead. The kind of death you wouldn't wish on anybody. No. 
believe I could have changed places with him. He must have been so lonely, so cold, so frightened. And knowing that he was going to die. Bugger of a place to bring a kid out to die. Piss off, please, Chris. Piss off ahead of it. Okay. Chris. I'm sorry. The alcohol isn't working anymore. Can't get drunk. You complaining about the quality of the alcohol I serve? <laughs> yeah. What's the good of it if you can't get drunk on it? I should report you to the licensing squad. Shavava. My little girl won't go to sleep if I'm not there. You've come this far, Kelly. Kelly, you've come this far. Now tell us where the grave is and all will be over. No. No, it'll never be over. Right. Now that's it. Now you were sitting here. Now you heard them burying Paul's body. Which direction do you think the sounds are coming from, Kelly? I think it was... You've remembered, haven't you? Yes. It was this way. Inspector Faulkner sends his congratulations. He thinks you all did very well. So do I. Yes, despite those of us who said there was no point. And despite those of us who were otherwise occupied saving crippled helicopters. Uh, we're working on that. Expect revenge. Which reminds me. <laughs> Air traffic control. <laughs> there are several cars out there that need washing inside and out. Over to you, Biggles. Take your dopey co-pilot with you. Who are they? Homicide, forensic. Chris, this is uh, Andy and Ted. G'day. All right, go on. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. Come on up. I see some heavies have arrived. Yeah. So, uh, what happens now? Well, they'll bring Paul's body out of the ground. Will I have to identify him? I think that'll be left to dental records now. Right. There'll have to be an autopsy, of course, to verify the manner of his death. But there's no doubt now. No. No, no doubt. After the autopsy, they'll release the body for burial. I'm sorry we couldn't provide a better outcome. Never expected you to have the power of life and death, Tom. I've heard that it uh, can be a relief for parents in your position to actually find the body. 
to be sure. On the whole, I suppose. Thanks for all the trouble you took. You won't take the body home with him? I'll think about it. Might bury him here. It's a peaceful place. Mostly it is. Sort of imagined a place like this. Even dreamt it, I think. Like forest, rocks, low scrub. Yeah, all right. 